Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome aboard my train. Uh, this talk uh, will take you to deep waters uh, of MQTT protocol, which is not a new topic, but I will try to present a kind of a new point of view how the MQTT uh, can be misused in an unusual kind of ways. Uh, how many of you know MQTT protocol? Just, yeah, great. So, I will be your train operator today. My name is Martin. Um, I used to work for Avast for 12 years. Uh, now I'm an independent researcher. Uh, my domain of expertise is mainly like everything low level. Uh, that means from chip and for a few last years also to cloud. Uh, I have a few vices myself. Uh, I'm a pretty heavy coffee addict. Uh, and with that comes also uh, my hobby, which is breaking the coffee machines and reversing them. Uh, and if you want to ask my age, I can tell you I remember the BBS bulletin board system, and that's all the information I'm going to present you today uh, came from. No, just kidding. So let's make a plan for our journey or for our trip today. Uh, at the first stop, uh, we will do some planning. So I will try to explain a bit what the MQTT is for those who don't know and also to map the landscape. So how is the situation with the MQTT protocol uh, out there, specifically like the publicly uh, facing uh, MQTT servers. That means like the servers uh, connected to the internet and available. In the next station, uh, we'll hop on a train and I will show you a few use cases of misconfiguration and security mishaps, I would say, that come with the MQTT protocol and MQTT uh, brokers. Then in the next stop, we'll change the train, uh, and I would like to show you uh, how it is possible, basically, from like hop from the MQTT and Ethernet, uh, internet protocols, to a different technology. So for example, ZigBee, Bluetooth Low Energy. Then, before I leave you at the terminus, uh, we will do a short demo, which is probably the cherry on top of this presentation, when I'll show you how you can misuse the MQTT to break the whole perimeter from the inside out. And at the terminus, I will leave you with a few thoughts. You can, uh, you can ask questions if there is going to be a time left. So. Usually my talks about IoT and, and the IoT security itself starts with a like IoT rant about how bad the situation is, how, how the S stands for security in IoT abbreviation. Uh, I will skip that this time because that could be pretty, pretty long talking. I will leave you with this quote that for me is like uh, just on point with the computer security and specifically with the IoT security. That's just... That's how it is. And to prove it, I will show you how bad the situation is now. So speaking of MQTT, uh, like I have this naive model for you who don't know what the MQTT is. It's very handy, lightweight protocol uh, that it's based on a publisher subscriber model. So you can basically publish to some topic. On the other side, there are subscribers that subscribe to a topic, and uh, the broker itself, which is the implementation of the MQTT, uh, realize the messages. Uh, to be more versatile, it allows you to subscribe as a subscriber to a wildcards uh, topic. So for example, the last subscriber here on the picture uh, basically consumes all the news, for either the weather or, or a sport uh, news. So this is basically a very simple model. This is, this is how it is. In terms of some specifications, uh, as I said, it's a publisher subscriber model. Uh, it's payload agnostic, so it really doesn't matter uh, what the payload is. It's just for, for the implementation, it's like a binary blob. So whatever you put in there, it got transmitted. Uh, the topics are organized in tree-like structure, what you've already seen. Uh, when subscribing, the wildcards can be used. Uh, there are actually two wildcards. The one is uh, Hashtime, which stands similarly to file system for asterisks, so anything. 
and then there is a plus sign, which means like one letter in, in terms of, uh, for example, the file system and file names. Uh, in this case, it means like one level in a tree, one uh, and exactly one. Uh, usually, it operates through TCP port on 1883. Uh, if there is a TLS implementation, it uses 8083. Uh, two distinctive features of the MQTT itself uh, are last will and retain topics. Uh, last will is basically used uh, in an environment where the connection is not very reliable, and it's used in a way that when the broker uh, loses the connection with the client, it's able to publish on behalf of a disconnected client uh, some payload on some topic, which is uh, set during the connection. So that's uh, typically being used for uh, notifying all the other subscribers that the client went offline, for example. The retain topic uh, is just a flag when you're publishing. You can say this is a retain content, and the content stays at the topic. So whenever new, it's like a last state of the topic. So whenever uh, any new subscriber subscribes uh, to a retain topic, it gets immediately the late, uh, latest status or the last status. Sorry. Uh, in terms of implementations of this, of this protocol, the most prominent and probably most famous one is Mosquito. If you crunch a bit of data, you will see that like 80% coverage or 80% of MQTT servers around the internet are based on a Mosquito server. Uh, this particular implementation supports ACL lists, which is very important part you can set basically like fine-grained access to topics and clients. So you can say this client can access this topic, this client can write, read only or write only. So it's a it's very useful feature. Uh, then uh, the implementation supports uh, obviously the plain text uh, transport, which is over TCP, then TLS, and also WebSockets. Uh, in terms of authorization and authentication, you can have like the username password combination, client certificate, you can even um, basically do a kind of uh, authorization by, by just name of the client. So when the client connects, it specifies its own ID and that could be used as well. What it allows uh, on top of that is like you can create multiple listeners. That's handy for a situation when you, for example, have, um, I don't know, you have, you have clients that are not, uh, let's say, computational able to support TLS, so you have like a segment of network when there is no TLS supported, and then you have another segment when you can connect the clients uh, using the TLS. That's why the multiple listeners are uh, supported. So, Speaking of my voices and my diagnosis in the beginning, I didn't say that I have a slight OCD. And that is basically why this talk uh, even happened. Because uh, I am tend to return to previous things I've done, and I've done this research before. Uh, specifically in 2018, we published the article that there are almost 32,000 of MQTT servers openly available on the internet, and by misusing them, you can um, sip the data from uh, home automations out there, and even control some of them. So I written back, uh, and the, the whole thing uh, is because of the out-of-the-box problem. Well, that, that's the term I came up, maybe. Maybe it's, it's like uh, normally uh, used, but the thing is, uh, almost 60% of installation of MQTT servers have never been set up. So that, that's a common problem. We know it with everything, basically, not just the software packages and devices. Like, if you leave default credentials, or actually, if you install anything and it works, and you don't need to set up anything, it stays like that. Uh, any guesses what the default credentials for MQTT server is or are? None. The access is completely anonymous. That's the way how you install the MQTT server. Just to prove it, I'll have this very short demo recorded. recorded. So up there, there is a VPS server publicly facing the internet. And by just issuing the apt-get install mosquito, 
you install the Mosquito server, uh, the daemon starts, and it just works. It's open, and you've created in 11 seconds instance of an MQTT server that is widely open to the internet. So that's the probably main problem why there is so many servers out there. So since 2018, it got better a bit. So we've been in a situation where the defaults, uh, if you don't specify the anonymous access in a configuration file, was too true. So you had this implementation that is able to do all this kind of stuff, like, such as TLS, ACL, authorization, authentication, but like nobody uh, ever used that. So it improved a bit. So fast forward to 2022. Uh, in a new version of Mosquito implementation, uh, the defaults is to false. So the, no anonymous access uh, is available anymore. But still, uh, nobody uses the ACL lists, which is a huge problem, and I'll show you why. Uh, if we run the Shodan query on uh, and most prevalent MQTT versions nowadays, this is like uh, really fresh data, uh, you can see still the version 1.48, which is full of vulnerabilities, is out there, and it's on the top. What's more interesting here is this are the ser or these are the servers that are openly available on the internet with no authentication. And you can see there are even the versions 2.0. So that's kind of interesting fact. And the, the reason for that is obviously because it inherited the configurations. And also sometimes, you know, you know the, the feeling you upgrade something and it stops works, uh, it stops working. So you just change the configuration and allow all again. If we speak numbers, uh, in 2018 we had these 32,000 of servers on the internet uh, open. Then it went up. Uh, in 2020 there was like 85,000 already. And then I got lazy and in 2021 a lot of things happened for me. So I skipped that year to sample. So I did that this year. Wow. If I were a marketing person, I would say, see, I told you so. But th this, is, this is not uh, possible, right? I was digging into a data, why is this even possible? And the thing is, there is one country causing this anomaly, and that's South Korea. That's interesting. Uh, particularly one ESP, and also the versions of the MQTT, or, or actually the brands of MQTT implementation uh, is just MQTT because there is no fingerprint and the showdown can't tell you what kind of MQTT server it is. And it, it turned out actually that this can be another research uh, for, uh, for us, or at least for me, because that's interesting. They are selling uh, kind of an all-in-one box for fiber optics to homes. And that box uh, implements the MQTT server for unknown reasons. Because if you connect to it, there is no data flowing. It just sits there, it's open, but you can publish to it, you can subscribe to it, you can store to it. So you can possibly store uh, your own data there. So I fixed the chart. So I subtracted the South Korea. And now it makes more sense. Uh, you can see it keeps the trend, but what's more interesting is that there is a slight shift uh, in open servers on the internet. So it went actually a bit down, and that's maybe because of the uh, Mosquito version too. So let's hop on the train. Uh, I will show you a few use cases, uh, which are bad, but at least you'll, you'll get the feeling uh, why the situation is bad. So this is like a typical implementation. If you have somewhere MQTT broker, for example, in home automation, it sits just in the middle. There is some business logic, which is usually the automation itself. So very popular is, for example, home assistant, probably many of you know. 
Uh, and then there is done some bridging. So the idea is to bridge all the devices you have from different vendors or even data from, from cloud services into MQTT so everything speaks MQTT and it's easy uh, for the devices and cloud services to cooperate. In case of a devices, so that would be smart light bulb or switch, uh, it even bridges the technology. So Bluetooth low energy, uh, Zigbee, whatever comes to your mind. So this is like a typical, typical model and implementation. Uh, but there is one problem. If you don't set up the MQTT properly, if you don't use the ACL list, you are creating a huge, huge security hole because you are basically breaking the borders between the parameters. Because if anything can speak to anything, uh, there is no borders. We've seen also this implementation, so uh, the MQTT server is running on some public-facing VPS servers and everything is connected to it. it. From the security standpoint, it really doesn't matter because all these two situations are, are pretty bad. So this would be my first uh, recommendation. Always set credentials, always use ACL in the case of MQTT, and if possible, use TLS. You will see this slide once more, maybe twice more. <laughs> so this is one use case, for example, and it's a case of what we call uh, data poisoning. Uh, actually, there is, uh, there is no issue. This is some BTS station somewhere in Serbia uh, spinning out the data or a telemetry data through the MQTT server to the public internet. Like, I know it's bad, it's leaking data. For example, uh, part of the data is uh, like numbers of key cards being used to access the BTS station through the electric lock. But still, it's just like telemetry. You can't really control anything through that open MQTT server. But the problem is, if you don't set up ACL, uh, the data is still read-write. So if an attacker connects to this server, he can easily poison the data. He can change the telemetry, and that could be a huge problem. For example, the snapshot from the camera is updated uh, by the station once a minute. If you're going to update it every second, you can overwrite, basically, and poison, poison the data, the telemetry. Another application, or another use case, is an application called Antrex. That's an Android iOS application often used by home automation or just to basically share your geolocation with the rest members of your family or, or with the home automation so the automation knows where you are. That's all good. The problem is it speaks to MQTT and many users connected to MQTT that is open to the internet. In that case, you have a live stream or live feed as an attacker about where the user is. And you can easily record it over a period of week in this case and deduce some, let's say, behavior. You can find out where his house is. So this is, this is really bad as well. If you look Shodan and uh, basically search for Antrex topics, you will, you will see a lot of devices uh, or a lot of MQTT ser servers out there with this topic. A uh, pretty unique thing is this application that's again for Android iOS, I think, maybe just for Android. And the idea here is you can create your own dashboard to control something through MQTT. But what is unique in this case is that the configuration of the dashboard, including all the scripts, all the basically tweaking uh, you did, is stored into a one big JSON file which is published to the same MQTT server and stored there as a retained topic. So if you are an attacker, you just connect to a server, consume these topics, or consume this topic, and you will have the exact copy of a dashboard of someone else. And you can really use it, right? So again, all these things, all these use cases can be mitigated just by setting the credentials and using ACLs. Possibly use TLS as well. Now let's see how we can change the train, so how we can actually reach out to devices that are not connected to the Ethernet or Wi-Fi. 
I prepared, I didn't want to mess with someone's devices, so I prepared a short demo. Uh, we will be speaking about the open source firmware, which is quite uh, common as well in home automation. The idea behind this open source firmware is that you can create your own device, which speaks MQTT on one side, that's handy for the home automation systems, and different uh, technologies on the other side, so Bluetooth Low Energy, LoRa, GSM, GPRS, however you can configure the firmware. And the problem here is, uh, usually with the Bluetooth Low Energy, uh, it's used for a kind of, uh, I don't know how, how to call it, it's like a uh, presence control or presence detection. So it basically scans its surroundings with the BLE and uses that for, uh, for the automation to know that the particle person or device is in a reach. So you are at home or you are in a, some room. That's, that's basically the idea behind it. But the advanced future, uh, feature of, of this firmware is also that it's able or capable to write and if anything is able to write, what could go wrong, right? It's done in a kind of not, not very intuitive way, but uh, this alone is just enough to write to some BLE device. So you just need to send to a topic which uh, ends with slash config. That's the counterintuitive part. A JSON, which includes the address, the Bluetooth address or MAC address if you wish. Uh, then the UUIDs of the service and the UUID of the particle property you, you want to write. And then the payload, and that's it. So if you find this topic on the internet, on the open server, you can scan the, the surrounding of the device and you can even control the devices. So meet a unicorn board. That's a, that's a toy I <laughs> brought back from US when I was there. Uh, it's a Lego-like toy. Uh, it has an RGB horn, few servos, and uh, it speaks BLE. So let's put aside that I had to reverse uh, the communication protocol before, but I will show you on this toy how easy it is to control uh, the BLE device using MQTT through that gateway. So you can see the unicorn bolt sitting on the table, and next to it, there is kind of a monitor of what's going on on a MQTT topic, open MQTT gateway BH. Uh, so we can see how the data uh, is flowing and a terminal down there or shell. So I prepared a few payloads uh, that I'm going to send through just the MQTT, through that open MQTT gateway to BLE device. So you, you can see the data flowing uh, through the MQTT and the unicorn bot reacts. That's a funny case and it's, it's, uh, it's let's say, uh, not nothing uh, serious, but I can tell you that, for example, this toy is also able to update a firmware uh, over the BLE and there is no check. Now let's move to another open source framework, which is like widely adopted around, around the globe, and that's a Tasmoda. Like the Tasmoda firmware itself, it's an open source, it's a great firmware, it supports a lot of devices, and the basic idea is to replace a firmware, or to be able to replace a firmware on IoT devices, to break them free from their original cloud. So usually you buy a bunch of devices from different vendors, uh, all these devices, they have like their own cloud. And the problem is uh, to control them or even to keep your data private, so break the ties between the clouds, you need to somehow modify them. And that's when the Tasmota uh, comes in. Actually, it supports pretty impressive number of IoT devices. It's right now, it's like two and a half thousand devices from different vendors. And the support means you can flash the firmware uh, over the original one. And then you'll get a lot of new features. Zasmota itself uh, has a REST API and also speaks MQTT. And there are a few interesting 
commands and features of the Tasmota. One of them could be group topic. So basically, when you install the firmware, every device is by default in a is named like a like by a group topic, which is Tasmotas. So you can ask all Tasmotas in your network to update the firmware, for example, or to turn on. And because it's a default group topic, it stays like that. Again, short demonstration. I found out one server. This is a real server. Uh, so I, I was trying to hide the IP address. And it has a lot of Tasmota devices on it. Uh, the application I'm using, it's MQTT Explorer. It's a very handy tool. Uh, so you can see there are the topics, and the start topic is actually a Tasmota topic uh, on which the Tasmota publishes statuses of devices. You can see there is around 57 uh, topics under, under that uh, node. And if I issue the command status for Tasmota so with zero, that means give me all statuses for all devices. And right now, you have all the configurations uh, from the devices in the whole network, or actually uh, in all devices that are connected. And for example, part of the configuration is uh, IP address of default gateway, DNS server, SSIDs, and so on. So this is how, how easy it is to use the group topic to ask for information of all the devices. There is one particularly interesting command, which is WebSend, that has been replaced by a web query, which is even more powerful in new versions. And the basic idea is to be able, from the device, create a HTTP GET request to control something else. So the original idea was from Tasmota control another device using REST API. But there is no check. You can ask any server for, for HTTP request. So if you combine these two features, you can easily create a DDoS, right? This is just a DDoS on a small scale, so I'm running the HTTP server uh, on my own server, and then using the previous uh, MQTT server I found with a lot of Tasmotas, by just issuing one command, I'm getting all requests from all the devices uh, at the same time. So this is another example how, how you can misuse uh, just an open MQTT connection. And we are getting uh, to the end of the presentation, and now I will show you how easy it is to misuse the, just the MQTT uh, with anything else to break someone's perimeter to get inside the perimeter. For that, we will need a task motor any Tasmota device you can find, on, like hanging on an uh, MQTT server. There are actually two commands, and because there is no fine-grained uh, access control, uh, you can easily issue a command through MQTT which sets the URL from where the device will take the update of firmware. That's the OTA URL. Then you can issue the upgrade command as well, which basically is the trigger to do the update. Uh, if you put there one as a payload, it ignores the version check, so it basically downloads whatever you set in the first instance, and uh, like happily update the, the whole device. So let's make some plan. Uh, we are going to misuse one infamous device, which is the Mikrotic routers. Probably you heard uh, many CVEs around M uh, Mikrotic and research. Uh, we are going to misuse the one particular mis uh, CVE, which is able to enumerate all the user accounts uh, and the passwords from the device. And because the router, in this case, is closed from the outside, uh, like from the internet, uh, we will do that from the inside. We have the MQTT server in this perimeter. It really doesn't matter if it's out of the perimeter or if it's inside. And then we have one smart switch, which runs Tasmota. So the whole thing uh, works like this. We upload the rogue firmware. Remember, it's an open source. It's very easy to create your own firmware because it's open source. You can just change a few lines and create a new version, which you can upload wherever you want. 
Then, through the MQTT, these two commands I've shown you on, on a, a previous slide, uh, we will trigger the over-the-air update. That leads to a device getting its update from our server or from server that we control. And it gets extended with a new functionality. So we have a Tasmota that is able to speak generic TCP, MQTT to TCP proxy. Then we run at the, at the computer of attacker the counterpart, which transforms the TCP to MQTT commands. The tunnel is created, and then we can happily run the CVE exploit through the tunnel. That's pretty easy. And actually, it is that easy. Uh, these are the devices we are going to exploit, just, uh, as, so just for you to have like the physical, uh, physical uh, look of the devices. So that's the switch and the Mikrotik router. And this is the only thing we had to do in the firmware. We added three new commands, TCP connect, TCP send, and TCP close. Then we modified the main loop, which processes the data, and that was it. Uh, it's like 20 lines of code, maybe, altogether. And this is a demo of uh, the first step, updating the firmware. So this is our Rogue server, where the Tasmota and the Rogue firmware uh, is located. Then using, again, just the MQTT to publish into open MQTT server, which resides uh, inside the perimeter. Uh, we are going to issue the demo switch, which is the name of the device, and the common OTA URL without any payload. That gets us uh, parent configuration. So this is the default configuration for the Tasmota firmware update URL. Now we issue the same command, and as a payload, we'll put our malicious uh, URL. So if everything works, we should get a kind of result from the Tasmota, or uh, which which says that that the address changed. Okay, so here we go. You can see Tasmota uh, replied that the result is uh, the new OTA URL. Now I'm running the server to actually serve that uh, file from the server. And now I'm going to issue the command to upgrade. As I said, we need to provide the payload with one, which means take whatever is there, uh, no version checks. Yeah, and you can see the request is being made from the Tasmota to a rogue server for the firmware. The device goes offline. Now the update is taking place. So it shortly goes online again and do the final restart. So from now on, uh, the device, uh, you, you would probably even notice that the device restart, restarted itself. So from now on, the device is extended with that functionality that talks MQTT to TCP. The next stage uh, is actually to, to attack the router, we need to know the IP address of it. And we can leverage the Tasmota again. We can leverage the command for getting the status of the device, which contains the, the uh, configuration of a network. From there, there will be probably a default gateway, and we can assume that the default gateway will be the router IP address. So let's do that. So now you can see the Dasmota replied back, and there is a gateway address, which is presumably the IP address of the, MQ, uh, of the Mikrotik router. So now, the only thing we need to do is run our proxy script, which takes uh, the MQTT server, then the local port it will listen on, which is 10,000 in this case, 
then the target IP address and the target port. In case of the Winbox vulnerability, the target port is 8291, which is the interface for the Winbox management protocol. And the name of the Tasmata device again. So we are ready. And the only thing we need to issue is now is to run the exploit. I have the version for Python here. So it's pretty easy. You run the exploit with the target of localhost and the local uh, port the proxy is listening on. So now you, can, uh, you will see that uh, the exchange of data is happening. And we successfully run the exploit, and we've got all the usernames and uh, passwords for that particular router, which is inside the perimeter. We didn't like access anything from the outside. And using the same proxy, we can now leverage all we know already to actually connect to the router through that proxy. So you can see I'm again connecting to localhost, port 10,000, and I'm using the already exposed credentials to connect to the router. The exchange of data is happening through the MQTT. And you can see I have a full control of the router, and I can do whatever I want to open the ports or at the user, whatever. So that's how easy it is to proxy a traffic in someone's perimeter just using the MQTT. So what to say uh, at the end? Uh, I promised you will see this often. Uh, in case of MQTT, this is really crucial, and especially the part uh, using the ACL, because nobody really sets the fine-grained access control in MQTT servers, and it's a mess, and it's a huge security risk, because you can update firmware. For example, that's not only the case. Always secure your MQTT. Ideally, don't put it on the internet. Use VPN if you, if you must, because the risk would be sometimes high. It turned out that, that the MQTT is very, very well suited for automation of your garden. OK, so that's it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm ready to take questions. Actually, it went pretty good. We still have like six minutes, if, if I see it correctly. So uh, there is a uh, GitHub repo that's going to be the part of, of, uh, of the website uh, of Black Hat. So you can, you can go there. Uh, I put there all the scripts I've used for, for uh, the demo. Uh, the only thing I didn't put there is the source code for the modification of a Tasmota. Uh, I don't want to get in any trouble, but there is a binary, if you wish. So, any questions? So, in that case, thank you for your attention.